Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's um, an experimental verification. It's part of Tony's Verified Software Initiative. Um, there are two challenges with the, uh, with the, with the uh, case study. One is perhaps to analyze FreeRTOS for structural integrity properties. And that's um, a challenge in the automatic static analysis of, uh, of pointer programs. And it's not what I'm going to talk about. The second challenge I will talk about, which is to create a rational reconstruction of, uh, of FreeRTOS as though you had developed it top-down from an abstract specification all the way down to the existing code. And uh, the challenge is to do that, and in doing so, to discharge all the verification conditions completely automatically. Needless to say, I haven't done that, but it is the challenge. That's the, the objective and target of all this, is to get as closely as possible to that. Now, there are some um, active experimenters. There's Kay's Pronk from the Technical University of Delft, uh, who's been verifying free RTOS using the SPIN model checker. Um, there are, uh, th there's a group at uh, the University of Durham and, and the University of Teesside in the UK, Chung Chao Chin and his group, who've been doing code-level analysis, static analysis to develop uh, uh, invariants about the code and then to discharge those with, uh, with a model checker uh, and, uh, and a theorem prover. Uh, Peter O'Hearn at uh, Queen Mary University of London and colleagues at, at Imperial uh, have an interest in free RTOS, and Peter tells me he's going to have a, a doctoral student working in that area. And they've done some preliminary work uh, to find out that it is at least an interesting and difficult problem. Um, there's um, uh, Jose Nuno Oliveira at the University of Minho, which is in Braga in, in Portugal, and he's been using uh, functional programming and VDM to specify parts of free RTOS and to reconstruct the development. Um, there's uh, David Dayab at uh, the Universidade Federal de Rio Grande do Norte in, uh, in Natal in, in Brazil, and he's written a B specification of part of the top level functionality. We have colleagues at the National University of Singapore in Jin Son Dong's group who've been doing code level analysis. Uh, and there's the work that I'm going to report on uh, at York in the UK, which is collaborative with the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore in a, a project funded by the, uh, by the British Council. So why choose this pilot project? Well, it's an interesting case study, and just incidentally, it indirectly comes from, from Microsoft. Um, uh, Tony and I organized a, a, a workshop at Microsoft Research in Cambridge to collect some industrial problems, and uh, uh, Richard Barry came along with FreeRTOS as one of those. Uh, so it's been um, uh, uh, an interest of ours for the last two years. Um, I think modeling and verifying kernels is scientifically challenging, and I'll say more about that as I go through my presentation. There's a large community of users. There are 100,000 downloads of free RTOS every year, which makes it one of the top 100 out of about 200,000 codes that get downloaded from SourceForge. So that's a large community of users. They like to say, and I, I think I believe them, that it's the de facto standard for microcontrollers. Uh, so uh, verification could have a strong impact. It has relatively interesting functionality. We find it challenging to verify it, but it's actually a very small code base, only about 2,500 lines of code. But don't make the mistake that that makes it a very easy problem. It really isn't. Um, it's open source and well documented, at least informally. Um, so, as a verification uh, effort, if we could find some errors, because that's what makes verification interesting, is the errors that you find, um, we could also make some guarantees about what the rest of the code does. Um, the requirements are distributed throughout the informal documentation, and producing a, an abstract specification might, uh, might help people to use the, uh, the code more effectively. So, why is it difficult? Well, there's a very nice article by Gerwin Klein uh, on operating system verification, with it, which explains why uh, uh, kernel verification is such an important task for, uh, for verifiers and why it's, it's worth doing. Uh, it's a very good read. For me, the main difficulty is that the usual abstractions that make programming a bit easier just don't exist when you're programming the kernel. We have to implement uh, communication and synchronization. We have to provide scheduling guarantees. We have to uh, give some guarantee about interference freedom for tasks. And we have to provide the direct hardware interaction with, with devices.
device drivers and interrupts and, uh, uh, and clocks. Secondly, there are many very complicated pointer operations, and that's what really makes the verification difficult. That's what really makes it uh, of interest, I hope, to, to you as well as to me. Next point is that there are 14 different compilers that are used to produce code uh, for, uh, um, for kernels from FreeRTOS, and that means there are many complex configuration options and extensive parameterization, and that makes extracting the code you're going to verify very cumbersome indeed. I gave a, a talk at uh, uh, ECH in Zurich, and I challenged uh, some people in the audience to uh, perhaps you know, try to, to verify uh, FreeRTOS. I was talking about Tokenir, as it happens at the time, but I was saying, here's another interesting problem. I know that Cristiano Colgagno found it very, very difficult indeed just to, to extract the code from the code base that he would then use with, uh, with, uh, with Smallfoot, which was the analysis tool he, he wanted to use on it. No, I mean you can compile it for different platforms using one of the, these 14 different compilers. So there are things like uh, um, MinGW, C compiler, and those sorts of things. Um, but here's some good news. There's a cousin of FreeRTOS that's called SafeRTOS. And SafeRTOS has been certified uh, at um, um, uh, uh, integrity level three by the Technical University of Vienna for some important standards. Now, these are not standards that insist on formal verification, but it does show that you can actually certify this kind of co code base in some way. And the standards are IEC 61508, which is a general standard for software and electronic systems, <coughs> the Food and Drug Administration 510K, and the avionics standard DO178B. Um, as I say, these are not about formal methods. They're mostly about testing. 61508, for example, is all about um, uh, things like MCDC testing and so on. So what does FreeRTOS really do? It's a lightweight, embeddable, multitasking, real-time list of adjectives. Um, and uh, it uh, has a key assumption that the target system is going to just have a single processing unit. It's a library of types and functions that are used to build microkernels. Um, it's written in C with assembly language for the particular platform you're compiling for. It's been ported to most embedded system architectures, and it produces a very small, very tight kernel, only about four to nine kilobytes in size. Really very small indeed. It provides services for embedded programming, like uh, managing tasks, like inter-task communication and synchronization, like memory management, real-time events, and I.O. device control. Code's obviously divided into two, uh, a boot phase where you set up tasks and communication channels, and then the application execution, where you, you, you schedule and execute tasks. And scheduling is either prioritized, preemptive, cooperative, or some hybrid combination of any of those three. <coughs> what can we try to prove? Well, Cornelius Pronk at the Technical University of Delft has a very nice feasibility study of what we could prove about uh, uh, FreeRTOS. And he divides the properties into four areas, which aren't terribly surprising, I suppose, about functional correctness, which is what I'm going to talk about at the moment, about reconstructing a specification from the code and verifying compliance with that specification so you can advertise it as the guarantee for what FreeRTOS does. There are structural properties you might concentrate on instead, regardless of the functionality. You might be interested in, does it dereference any, any null pointers? You might be interested in whether it has memory leaks, or whether it depends on a particular order of expression evaluation. Um, uh, at the University of Parma, they have a tool called Claire, which checks C programs for compliance with, uh, say, the MISRA standard. And I think that FreeRTOS uh, very nearly gives you four figures of uh, non-compliance. Right? So nearly a thousand things that uh, the Claire tool would, would, would object to. So it's, um, uh, it, 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 it's very interesting code. You might be uh, interested in arithmetic problems like overflow and underflow. I'll, I'll talk just very briefly about that in a little while. There may be timing properties about whether or not uh, tasks get scheduled on time, plus or minus delta, and about interrupt latency time, the time from making an interrupt to actually having it handled. And then there are liveness properties like deadlock freedom for the scheduling mechanisms and uh, mutual exclusion guarantees and fairness of the schedule. Now, I'm interested mostly in refinement, so... There is some relevant work here. Uh, Craig has produced several very nice books which describe the refinement of microkernels in Z and hand proofs to accompany them. And the kind of microkernel he's interested in is, si is based on Labros's micro C operating system, which is very similar to FreeRTOS. And he refined from Z specifications into abstract types. So 
Uh, these are not programming language types. They've still got natural numbers and sequences and functions and so on in them. Uh, so they've got unbounded types. Um, he doesn't have any particular uh, uh, discussion of the heap, not even uh, heap size checking and so on. And his uh, um, uh, descriptions are non-algorithmic, although they're very, very interesting. They're non-algorithmic, so there's no mention of temporal properties. Now, with Leo Freitas, um, we've taken some of this work and refined it to, to uh, target data types. And Egon Burger has done something very similar uh, using ASM. Uh, Gerwin Klein and his colleagues at NICTA have some very, very inspirational work on the verification of the SEL4 kernel, which is, I think, famous enough for me only just to, to need to mention it in passing. Uh, this is a high-performance microkernel. The emphasis is on that high-performance. There's an abstract specification in Isabel Hull. It's refined into an executable specification in Haskell, then manually refined into a high-performance C implementation. The theoretical basis is separation logic. Um, it's on almost complete handling of C, and that's very impressive. There's about 8,700 lines of, uh, of code, which is you know, almost three times the size of what I'm talking about. There's about 200,000 plus lines of uh, Isabel Hull. I don't know for sure, I just quote the Isabel website. Uh, and about 30 man years worth of, of effort. And the emphasis is on functional correctness. David Dayab has this um, uh, B specification. And Yuhui Lin, one of my MSc students last year, uh, has um, uh, translated that into Z and then completed it because the B specification misses out a lot of the functionality. Uh, all these things you can download from the relevant uh, uh, institutions. You can download all the, all the code for the, for the specifications. So you can get Yahui Lin's work from York and David Diab's from, uh, uh, from uh, Natal in Brazil. So let me talk a little bit more about what FreeRTOS is. Um, tasks transit according to this uh, state diagram. Um, the, uh, there's a currently running task. There's a, a ready uh, queue. And the ready queue is prioritized so that the next ready uh, task to be scheduled is, is one of those ones that has highest priority. You can block on temporal delays or external user interactions. You can be suspended for various reasons. And there's an idle task that runs when nobody else does. It has the lowest priority of all. And it might have an idle task hook to run something every time it gets scheduled when nothing else is around. And that's the kind of thing that puts a device into a low power mode, that kind of thing. There are coroutines, uh, which are for prioritized cooperative scheduling. And all coroutines are prioritized, and they all have lower priorities than tasks, apart from the idle task. So there's some interesting uh, 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 ways of, uh, 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 of programming these embedded systems. Intertask communication is based on queues, semaphores, and mutexes. Queues are just FIFO um, uh, 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 lists accessed by the tasks. The items are fixed sized and fixed capacity in advance of, uh, of, um, uh, of scheduling anything. There's a default copy semantics, which means you've got no protection for things that are accessed by pointers. If you put a pointer in the queue, you can't guarantee that the thing you're pointing to remains the same during the lifetime of its, of its existence in the, in the queue, or that the ownership stays the same either. Um, tasks can wait for insertion or deletion or for space in the queue. Uh, and this can all be used as a, as a kind of synchronization technique. So semaphores are... Uh, uh, attached to, to um, sorry, big pardon, semaphores are for uh, synchronization between tasks and interrupts. So uh, a semaphore is just a singleton or empty queue uh, with irrelevant content, and the P operation on the, on the semaphore is to empty the queue, and of course that can block if the, if the queue is already empty, and the V operation is to uh, have a, an interrupt fill the queue. So this is a communication between a task and, a, and an interrupt. And a mutex, as I was saying, is actually a binary semaphore that's attached to a particular uh, shared resource. For real-time aspects, it's interesting. You look through the code of, uh, of FreeRTOS, and you don't see real-time mentioned except in, in, in one very small place. So real-time is offered by um, the, micro the microcontroller's internal timer offering uh, 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 periodic interrupts, and FreeRTOS counts these interrupts. And uh, this allows it to, to offer a delay mechanism and uh, a task preemption facility. When it does that, it does it by just doing a little bit of arithmetic. And so it, um, it assumes a default of a 32 kilohertz um, uh, clock. And in the, in the configuration file, you might specify what your desired tick rate is, say 1 kilohertz. 
And then in a particular registry, you'll just do that little bit of division. And one of the, one of the famous errors in, 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 uh, in pre artos is to get that wrong and to have underflow or overflow on the, on the arithmetic and get an erroneous value and very strange clock behavior. Um, memory organization, well, the kernel allocates uh, memory just before the scheduling starts for all the, all the tasks and, uh, and, and, and queues so that they can do dynamic scheduling within that allocation. So it's a big byte array, which is essentially a heap. And it uh, is used for task stacks and queues. And the remaining RAM has to hold all the static and, and global variables. Now, typically, we're talking about very small devices, only about 10 kilobytes. And FreeRTOS programmers talk about the Goldilocks configuration, that you get the heap not too big and not too small. If you make it uh, too big, then the program might not compile because you don't have room for the rest of the static variables. And if you get it too small, you get to compile it, but during runtime, uh, you can't allocate the, uh, the tasks, task stacks. Why is that interesting? Well, it's a configuration matter, and so it implies additional correctness criteria, which actually aren't visible in the code at all, but you have to stand back from the code and understand what it is you're trying to, to, uh, to verify. And that's true for all sorts of configurations about, uh, about FreeRTOS, of which this is one particular example. So let me just talk about pointers in program refinement. Um, this part of the project, the part that I've been mostly uh, involved in, is to choose a pointer model for the FreeRTOS refinement develop some idealized code for the main data structure, which is a priority queue, and compare it with the, existing queue, with the existing code, and then reconstruct a rational development of how the code got to be as it is. Now, there are four candidates we could have for that uh, uh, pointer model. We could have a naive pointer model that takes a holistic view of storage, a bit like Strachey's two-level model. We could have an abstract sharing model, a bit like um, uh, the, uh, the model of, uh, of, of Tony and Jifeng Ha. Uh, where, they t where they have a, a, a trace-based model of, uh, of pointers. Uh, or you could use separation logic, which is very popular, or you could use dynamic frames, and we've chosen to use the latter, not separation logic. Dynamic frames is the, the work of Yanis Cassios, who was one of Hainer's doctoral students, and for his work uh, um, uh, produced uh, a theory that was published just last year in, in my journal. Um, and um, uh, this, this, this is... Um, um a model-based description of pointers fits in very naturally, very nicely with the notion of refinement. So here's the kind of problem that we're solving. Um, think about functional and, and, and framing requirements. Suppose you've got a specification C that just says increment X, and then you've got a context for that where you're manipulating Y. Y becomes zero, and then do as, as C uh, specifies. What can you say after C about Y? Well, in a non-modular setting, you might lift C to add the other variables. Suppose they're exactly y and z. And you say the rest of the variables stay the same. In a modular setting, you might actually uh, try to be anonymous about what the rest of the state is. And you say, well, I'll ensure a post condition that x gets incremented, and the only thing I'll modify is x. So here's an example of that kind of thing. Here's a specification and its refinement, which are two modules. The specification has a, a ghost variable, a specification variable s, which is a, a set of numbers, a set of integers. Two operations, insert and find. Insert makes sure that x goes into the set. Find keeps the set constant and returns whether or not x is in the set. And then the refinement has a program variable, which is a list of uh, integers that's, in, that's used to implement s. So there's the, uh, the specification variable s also included. And what's essentially a retrieve relation between the two. It says you can retrieve the ghost variable s if you take the list x and collect all the elements in the range of of the sequence and put them in the set, and that's your abstract set. So there's a kind of retrieve relation for uh, the correctness of, of the refinement. The insert, the more concrete insert, ensures that x goes on the front of the list, and the, uh, the find operation <coughs> keeps the list constant, and that, that implies that the ghost variable is also constant, and returns whether or not you can find an index that indexes the element in your list. Now. The problem that's being solved in, in dynamic frames is the problem of abstract aliasing. So the framing requirement for the insert operation, uh, the abstract one, is that it, it modifies S. Right? Now, you translate that into a wider context. Suppose the rest of the variables are X and Y, so it keeps X and Y constant. Now, that translation is unsound in the presence of pointers, um, because what if the, the, the representation of either of those variables, X or Y, share heap locations 
with the, uh, the representation of S, what's going to be L in the refinement. And that's the unsoundness I'm talking about. So there are two solutions to the abstract aliasing problem. One is to impose restrictions that avoid the problem, and the other is to make the problem a first-class first class citizen and say, well, the abstract aliasing problem I can specify, and then I can say, and I don't want it. And that's the approach of, um, of um, uh, dynamic frames. Peter O'Hearn likes to say, when he teases me about not using separation logic, he likes to say that what I'm doing is working in the semantics of separation logic. And I think that's true. Dynamic frames could be viewed in that way. There are some things that make it a little bit more general, uh, some things that uh, Yanis Cassios um, uh, uh, claims, which I, which I agree with. Um, but essentially, dynamic frames fits in very nicely with the model-based specifications that I like to write. So here's um, uh, just the methodology of dynamic frames. Um, suppose you've got uh, a set of an infinite set of locations lock, an infinite set of values val, and that a region is any set of locations. Now, store functions are going to be finite functions from locks to val, and a particular store, little sigma, is going to be one of those. Store expressions are going to have the name sigma in their alphabet. Store relations are going to have the name sigma and the name sigma dash in their alphabet. The used locations are just the domain of that storage, uh, that storage function sigma, and the unused locations are just the complement of that. I need a little bit of notation, and that's what I'm leading up to. This Greek letter xi is the preserves operator, and it says if you take, um, if you take the, uh, uh, the storage mapping sigma and restrict it to uh, the, the set of locations f, then that part of the storage map doesn't change. And that's what this notation is doing here. This is a domain restriction. That's a function, that's a subset of the domain. And so we just take this portion of the storage mapping, and it doesn't change between the before version and the after version. So what xi f means is that we don't touch the locations in f. The modifiers operator, this delta, is what can be changed, what we have license to change in the specification. And so delta f says, the complement of F is untouched. So we're allowed to touch the things in F. We touch only the things in F. What I'm leading up to is this theorem, which, is, which uh, encapsulates the methodology of, of dynamic frames. A little bit more notation. Suppose F is a region, so it's a set of locations in store. Suppose E is an expression. It depends on variables, and they have values recorded by the store, so it depends on sigma. We say that F frames E, so this set of, of locations frames E, just in case for every after store, sigma dash, if we don't touch any of the things in F, then E remains constant. So we've got enough locations there to talk about the constancy of the expression. Right? Five minutes, right. So... E and D on sigma are independent if we can find two frames for them that are disjoint. And so my theorem now is if we uh, touch only the things in F and we have a frame G for the expression D and F and G are disjoint, then of course D will remain constant. Right? We'll be able to partition the storage. So here's the dynamic frames method. Using that theorem... That theorem, we can divide into two parts, really. A rely on a guarantee <coughs> condition, I think. So if you can find f and g, and you're, you're interested in this expression d, uh, and you, um, uh, as I said before, you touch only the things in f, let's make that the implementer's responsibility, and the client will have the responsibility of finding a frame g for his expression that's disjoint from f. So here's our rely part of the condition, and here's our guarantee part of the condition, and from that you can conclude no interference between the representation of some specification you're using in a library and the code that you're writing. And that's the, uh, the dynamic frames method. Now, I've got three minutes left, I think. So I want to talk just a little bit about the specification and verification of free RTOS, and then tell you about uh, uh, an anomaly. The Z specification um, uh, has been uh, um, uh, written by Yuhui Lin, a bit by me, a bit by Leo Freitas, and a bit by Xu Chang. Uh, we've used Z tools and Z language, but we could have used any reasonable theorem prover and any associated notation with it. The refinement to code is using dynamic frames, as I've said. It's an, a, 
much less advanced state. There's still an awful lot to do. But here's the kind of bottom line for the talk. Here's a property that we've found that uh, has been violated. This property has been found by one of my colleagues in Bangalore, Sumesh uh, Divakaran. And if you go to this part of the documentation of FreeRTOS, you'll find this statement. Should more than one task block on the same queue, sorry, should more than one task block on the same queue, then the task with the highest priority will be unblocked first. Now, a failure of that would imply a failure of priority inheritance, which would imply a failure of the way that FreeRTOS deals with priority inversion, which is a famous problem in real-time systems. So I'm going to finish my talk by just doing a symbolic execution, just run through a, a picture of the system. Um, here's what the system looks like, some of the principal data structures. Here's a priority queue, right? Here are the, the different priorities and lists at each priority. Here's the current running task, and here's a list of, uh, of tasks that are blocked waiting to send. So let me populate that. Here's the idle task. It's called main. It's got priority zero. Here are four tasks with different priorities. And they're going to execute some code, and I'll explain which one does which to who as I go through. So first of all, main is going to start the scheduler. And that causes main to be descheduled. And the next highest task to be scheduled in its place, and that's task one. Task one wants to send, actually, to task four using this queue and this channel, which is a, a local data value. But task four isn't running, so, so nobody will receive this. So it gets blocked and goes from here to here. Nobody's executing, so we'll take the next highest priority, which is task two. Task two comes in. It wants to do the same kind of send. But nobody's uh, going to send to task four, but nobody else is executing, of course, so it gets blocked and goes in this queue. Task three gets scheduled, does the same thing, gets blocked and ends up in the queue. And now task four finally gets scheduled. But it does something very strange. It changes the, uh, it changes the priority of task three and lifts it to five. And task three, you'll see, has priority two. So it lifts it to five. Now it does a receive. So it should receive from task three, shouldn't it? It's the highest priority that's, that's blocked, right? But actually what happens is that it receives from task one. And then, of course, it gets swapped out. Task one comes in, commits suicide. Task four comes back in and does another receive. Unfortunately, it receives from task two. Task two and task four get swapped. Task two commits suicide. And finally, task four does a receive, and task three gets it. So there's, some, there's, a, there's clearly an anomaly here. The, uh, the priority mechanism hasn't been copied over as a kind of added feature into the handling of this queue. And so that does, as I say, imply a problem with the, with the, with the treatment of priority inheritance, and therefore priority inversion is a problem in the system. Yes, I have to finish, right. So just, just to say, it really is a, a deceptively hard problem. There are some interesting theoretical results about refinement with pointers using dynamic frames and so on. Some practical lessons about how to do that kind of, uh, uh, of refinement. Some interesting anomalies coming out. And all the things we do are repeatable. You can compile free RTOS, you can use our main code to do that, and you can watch that priority problem happen. It's not something that's just in the, in the presentation and can't be reconstructed. And if you want to know more about this, I've got a... a, a, a um, half a dozen lectures at the UN uh, summer school in, in South Africa in, in August 2011. Uh, 
it, and they're absolutely fair comments. And I, I think I've gathered 13 important requirements for free RTOS. And uh, I think in my UN summer school, I'll do exactly what you suggest. Thank you very much. Any, anybody else? Oh, sorry. It's only in the um, uh, in the preparation for this talk that we uh, we, we, we we found this particular uh, we, we heard about it before this. And we had a workshop in, in Bangalore just uh, uh, about two weeks, three or four weeks ago, and that's where we that's where we discussed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you have a week to write a virus to exploit that bug until it's too late to try and fix it. So, I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Rob Putnam from Axis who will talk about an experiment in how to structure engineering. <coughs> okay, um, thank you, Tony. Um, <coughs> so just to, um, for the next 25 minutes, I'll start to tell you about a, an experiment called Token Ear. Um, this seems to have been an amazingly, when I think back, long-running piece of work. It all started, actually, about nine years ago. Um, and I prepared these slides yesterday um, using the principle of just-in-time engineering. And having kind of had a feel for the audience that, that um, uh, at this event this week. I started with the assumption that probably quite a few of you haven't even heard of this work yet or before. So I'll try and start at the beginning of the story and I'll, I'll go through the early bits of the story quickly um, and then I'll get to what's been going on more recently um, as soon as we can. So I'll give you some context and where it all started. Um, I'll run you through the backstory of how we came to be where we are. Most importantly, we've got some numbers for you. I'm, I'm a great fan of empirical engineering, so we actually have some, some metrics in terms of productivity and defect rate and stuff that we can show you for the system. Um, I'll then talk about what happened from 2008 onwards, um, which is where the fun really started, because that's when we flung the project into the wild, as it were, um, and, and allowed other people to look at it. And I'll tell you what happened since then. Um, so it all started a long time ago, in 2002. We'd done a piece of work for a company called Mondex, which is now part of the MasterCard organization. We'd built something called the Multos CA. This is the certificate authority for the Multos smart card operating system. It's, uh, it's the root of the, the PKI of the Multos smart card. Um, so have I lost this microphone? Me. Um, OK, is that better? OK. Um, and this was an amazingly secure system. It was subject to. Um, some remarkable computer-based and also physical security um, concerns. I think, Jim, you probably visited it, didn't you? It was an incredible facility, extraordinary facility, like something out of a James Bond movie. Um, and having done that, we published the results uh, in 2002. And as a result of that, the phone rang, and it was a gentleman from the NSA who said, would you like to come and tell us about that project? Come over to our conference. The conference is called HCSS. I do recommend it to you. It's an excellent, excellent event in Baltimore. Uh, it's coming up in May again this year. So we went over to the USA to talk about that project. And at that conference, the gents from the NSA basically challenged us. They said, well, do you guys think you could build a secure system, a demonstrator for us to demonstrate, well, to demonstrate whatever you want to do, you know, to, to demonstrate formal methods or, or verification? Uh, and we said, yes, please. We didn't think about that too long. Um, and the NSA said, OK, we've got this much money available. They told us how much money they had to spend. That was the, the fixed budget to do this work. Um, and the, the subject of this demonstrator was the, the system called Token Ear. We were asked to meet a standard, a particular standard called the Common Criteria. This is the ISO, the current uh, ISO standard for the development of secure systems. Um, and it defines, for its own reasons, seven levels of assuredness or something like that. They tend to be these rating systems. They're like a bit like hotel stars. You know, you know that a four-star hotel is a bit better than a three-star hotel, but you're not quite sure why. Um, so assurance evaluation level five and above is basically where the fun starts uh, in the common criteria. That's where the standard starts calling for formal methods um, and strong verification of various system properties and so on. Um, it was widely considered in industry at the time to be kind of, all oh, too difficult or nobody can do it or oh, it's too expensive. And there was lots of excuses flying around about why you couldn't do that kind of level of engineering. Um, so the, the challenge the NSA set us was to basically prove people wrong, to show that you really could do that standard of engineering at a reasonable price um, and that it was technically tractable to do that kind of work, or at least to do the best we could at the time. Um, 
So off we went. The context of the system looks like this. It's, um, it has some rather amusing uh, terminology. It has something called a, protective, a protected enclave. Uh, in English, that's a room. Um, and the room has a, the enclave has a portal, which also in English is a door. Um, and inside the door, there are some computers that you want to do things with. Um, and on the outside of the system at the boundary, there's a fingerprint reader, there's a smart card reader writer, and there's a terminal that shows you the status of the system. So the idea is you approach the system, insert your credentials, which are your smart card and your thumbprint. The system decides if it likes you or not. If it likes you, it deposits a little digital certificate on the smart card, opens the door, and you're allowed to walk into the enclave. The certificate on the smart card allows you to do something. It grants you some capability or some credentials to, to use the machines which are inside this protected environment. So it's a kind of, it's a bit biometric. There's some access control issues and there's some sort of cryptography stuff going on as well with the granting of these certificates. So it's a nice little demonstrator system. Um, one other very important feature of this system is that it is unclassified. It is a demonstrator system um, within the NSA's research group, um, but it is formally unclassified, which, you know, without that I couldn't be here to tell you about it at all. We couldn't have done the project as a British company and so on. So that was a nice starting point for us. So the idea was to engineer this software in the middle here, what's called the ID station, which basically is the thing that decides whether it likes you and whether to grant you access to the portal uh, and, and issue you with a certificate and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Oh, how did I do that? I don't know. Um, so what we did was to redevelop and re-specify the core functionality um, so it controls access to the enclave. There are various administrative functions as well. So there's a guard role. If the guard is present, then the door can be open in, in more states than if the guard were not present. There's an alarm system as well, which may or may not be alerting the guard of various bad things happening. Um, there's a security officer role who's allowed to start the system up and shut it down. So there's also various sort of role-based um, authentication things going on and what you can do with the system depends on who you are, this kind of stuff. Um, and there's an archive um, and a log um, facility with the system so that you can get a trail, an audit trail of what it's been doing. One particular constraint was that we didn't have access to the real hardware. There is actually one of these systems uh, at the NSA's um, offices in Maryland, but we weren't permitted access to that hardware because it's, it's in a place where we can't get at. Um, so what we did was to write software which simulated the outside world. So we wrote simulations of all the peripherals uh, and the outside world so that we could build and run the system on a desktop PC um, and also actually have two desktop PCs, one running our system and another desktop PC simulating the outside world and provoking the system and injecting faults and attack scenarios and whatever. So it runs on a pair of PCs connected by a network. Um, here's a little bit more detailed view. So the pink blob in the middle is the TIS core functions. Um, that's the high integrity bit. That's the bit that matters. The white blobs are things like the device drivers and the simulations of, of the peripherals around the outside. Uh, which we also developed, but we developed to a, perhaps a reasonable standard of engineering, but not as, as rigorously as the pink bit in the middle. Um, so we developed both of those sections, um, but with the pink bit subject to perhaps more, more level of formality. In terms of development process, um, just very quickly, I guess the goal was to be formal but practical. They, the, the NSA challenged us to be as formal as we could be, but at the end of the day for their money, they wanted a running system. You know, they wanted us to actually produce code that you could compile and get binaries and you could run. So there was a real constraint on us to actually produce a working system, which meant pragmatically we had to make some choices about how far we went with some of the verification steps and we didn't, you know, go for full refinement, for example, because we probably wouldn't have had enough money to do that. Um, so we did the best we could, knowing how much money we had to spend. Uh, the requirements engineering work was done using a method that we, we refer to as the reveal method. Um, this is something Praxis has developed over the years. It's very much inspired by the work of Michael Jackson's problem frames approach um, and sort of adapted by my former colleague Anthony Hall, uh, particularly with a focus on safety and security related sort of non-functional requirements, particularly geared towards that style. The high level abstract specification was written in Z of the functional behavior and that was then refined manually into a lower level, more concrete specification, um, also in Z. The implementation is in Spark, uh, which is a programming language particularly designed for this kind of system. Earlier today, if you were in the session earlier, Bertrand des described Spark as a monastery, which I think is perhaps a little harsh, but 
um, not close. Uh, it's a monastery where at least the doors are open uh, and it's growing slowly. We do, we do, we do have an intake of novices every year um, that join our particular conflab. Uh, and the language is growing and, and growing in capability over the years. Does anyone know why these slides keep changing? I don't know. Um, in terms of proof, there was some proof done at the Z level of, of, of at least one of the security properties. At the code level, in the pink blob in the middle, we did full proofs of type safety, um, which is very robust in Spark indeed. Spark is extremely pedantic about things like type safety um, for things like overflow and underflow and range violations and absolutely everything. Um, and we did a partial correctness proof of one of the major security properties of the system. Um, that was for simply for reasons of budget. We didn't have enough money to do all of the security properties at that level, so we did a proof of one of them. Um, so there's kind of just enough partial correctness proof to establish that property, um, and we left it at that. And there was a team testing the system, um, doing the kind of intrusion testing and reliability testing. A separate company called SPRE were engaged by the NSA. Um, and that was actually done over the internet. You're literally at a PC on the desk in, in Bath, in our office, running our system. Uh, and another PC in Albuquerque, New Mexico, running the test environment and the simulation environment, kind of throwing data at our system at an accelerated rate. Um, so that was independently done. As I said, we didn't have the real hardware, which we'll, we'll come back to. So a few metrics to get to the bottom line. The core of the system, the bit that's written in Spark, is a nearly 10,000 lines of code. Uh, logical lines of code. There are no dependence, this sounds unusual possibly, there is in that code no dependence on any library or any COTS component of any kind. It is designed to run on a bare board, you know, what we would call a bare board up solution. It will run on a microprocessor with no operating system, no libraries of any sort whatsoever, um, which is the way we normally write Spark because that's its, its traditional environment. Um, the supporting code around the outside was, as I said, the device drivers that talk to the network stack, that talk to the test environment. That was another 4,000 or so lines of code. In terms of productivity, it was unusually high at 38 lines of code per day. That is a reflection of a rather small team. Excuse me, I'll go back. Um, it was all done in 260 person days, which is not much in the, in, in the world of real, I quote, in, where real is in quotes. In commercial software engineering, 260 person days is peanuts. Um, you know, that's three people for nine months part time. It really isn't a great deal of money. Um, so it was done by two and a half people of working mo two, two full time and one half time person for about nine months uh, in 2003. We did the whole thing and we delivered it. This is a defect removal injection chart. Um, we saw one of these earlier in a slightly different format, but this is the defect counts. Um, introduced and removed during development. Um, if it's not obvious how to read this, I'll give you an example. So the three here shows that there were three defects. And if you follow up to the top left, if you follow up the left diagonal, you come to three defects that were introduced in the con in construction of the Z specification, which were found in system testing. So the number here, if you follow up and down, shows you, so 10 defects introduced in the Z design and discovered and removed during coding. So on this sort of diagram, what we're looking for are small numbers to the right, because numbers to the far right of this diagram are both embarrassing and expensive. Uh, they cost a lot to fix, and they tend to be embarrassing if they're discovered late in the day. Um, and we're looking for small numbers on this final diagonal, because these ones are, again, expensive to fix um, later in the process. So there were 54 total found during development, eight of which we would have considered to be later than we would have liked. So the eight, which are here, two, three, two, and one, were considered to be you know, rather expensive uh, in that regard. But they were at least found during development before we delivered the system. What happened after we delivered it? Um, the independent test team found no bugs. Um, and they did throw a lot of test cases. They threw about four years' worth of usage at it and at an accelerated rate you know they said well what would happen if you do you know for the system over about a four-year period okay we'll run that many test cases through the system at an accelerated rate um, our customers at the NSA for four years did not report any bugs in the system they did look we know they looked because we used to get emails from one of the guys there saying I think I've broken one of your proofs about once a month we get an email saying I think I've broken it Rod we found a bug this would be followed by an email from my team saying, oh no, you haven't. 
Um, maybe some, you know, some assumption was wrong. Um, so there were some exchanges. So we knew they were looking. They were trying to reproduce the proofs and trying to break them. So that's good news so far. Um, we then decided, well, we really ought to publish that. So we presented the results at the HCSS event, again, going back in 2004. But it's an NSA conference for which no proceedings exists um, and is unknown in, in, in the world of publishing. So, so nil point to England uh, in this particular competition for, for producing a, a, a report that no one knows about. So we thought, okay, we'll try again. We went back to the NSA and we said, well, how about we publish a conference paper? And we found a conference called the International Symposium on Secure Software Engineering in 2006. So we thought, oh, super, we'll publish in that conference. And that paper was approved, um, and that conference sank without a trace. Um, downstairs in the demo fest area, there's a, a demonstration of the academic uh, search engine um, that, that the guys at Microsoft have put together. So I thought, I oh know, I'll look for it on the academic search engine. It's not there. This conference proceedings is not even indexed. It's not on Google Scholar. It's not on the Microsoft's academic page. So this conference sort of sank without a trace. So the next idea, well, why not open source it? This came about the time when the verified software repository was being discussed and set up. So why don't we open source it? This seemed like a crazy idea at the time. The NSA is not known for open sourcing its products. Um, but we tried it. We said, well, OK, let's try. And I suggested this to our customers at the NSA. Um, and a couple of years passed until mid-2008. And I got an email from the NSA saying, we've got it. Um, the NSA Technology Transfer Office came to a position of granting a license for the product, which allows us to distribute it widely and freely in source form. So we were very, very pleased about that. Um, and as of October 2008, all of the stuff became available. Excuse me, I've obviously got these slides on some sort of timer. Um, without knowing it, my, uh, my ability with PowerPoint is failing. Um, and also, all of the tooling to reproduce the product and to reproduce all the proofs is also freely available and downloadable. Particularly, the compiler is GCC, so that's easy to get um, from a reputable vendor. Um, the proof tools are freely available um, um, from us or from various places. Um, also, things like the Z tooling that we use, that's all freely available as well. So we tried to make it empirical um, by allowing people to reproduce the result. So what do you get? Um, well, you pretty much get everything. You get the requirements, the protection profile. The thing called the security target is the formal statement of security policies that we're required to produce, specs, designs, the defect reports. So there are defect logs for all the de those 54 defects that we found, uh, test cases, proofs, the whole works, everything in source form, all the software. You get the supporting software in the simulation environment so you can rebuild the test environment and actually bring it up and run it and poke it and play with it, the whole thing. Um, the only thing you don't get in the release are the invoices uh, <laughs> because we considered it at the time sensitive about how much money we were actually paid. But I said it was 260 person days in 2003 dollars. So you can probably have a, a fair guess at what kind of money was involved. Uh, it wasn't a huge amount, I, can I assure you. Um, so... In preparing the public release, something interesting happened. First thing was, I found a bug in it. In preparing the release of the material for public consumption, I really did find a bug. This turned out to be a bug of omission by the original team. A decision was taken when the original project was done to forego one type of proof, one particular step of proof. Um, it was not done at the time for reasons of budget, and just not having enough effort to do it. When I reproduced the proofs much later, I, I did those proofs, and lo and behold, I found a bug, which is interesting. There is one failure mode with verification tools and static analysis tools, folks, and that's not to use them. It's a failure mode we see a lot of clients fall into. They say, oh, we won't use that tool, and well, it doesn't find any bugs. So this thing can happen. Since we released it, a chap called Diomedis, excuse me, Diomedis Spinellis reported a bug by inspection. He just read the code and found an and that should have been an or, or was it the other way around? I can't remember. So an AND that should have been an OR, it was correct from a data flow point of view, it was correct from a type safety point of view, it wasn't correct from an invariant partial correctness point of view. Um, so that was an interesting one. There's been another static analysis tool look at it called CodePeer, pour over the code. That found a few minor issues. I said they're minor issues in that they're, they're not necessarily observable bugs that you could actually say, well, that's a failure of the system, but they're things that we would feel embarrassed enough to fix given the chance. They're things that we would fix. So we consider them to be defects. Um, and 
the root causes of all of these are in the paper that Jim and I and Jim's research student M&A wrote a few years ago that appears in Tony's, I have to get the word right, Tony's Festschrift book. That paper is in the book. If you want to see the root cause analysis for these defects, it's all there for you. Um, so there are a few challenges being picked up by some other groups now, which I'm pleased to see some other groups picking it up. Jim, as I said, um, and MNA Adal did some really interesting work on model checking of the system security properties. So what you did, I believe, Jim, is to set up the system as a state transition model of, you know, door opens, door closes, person enters the enclave, person logs in, whatever. Um, and then to explore that state transition system using a model checker to see if insecure states could be reached. And they popped up one interesting one, didn't you, Jim? The fact that the shoulder surfing attack. The shoulder surfing attack is where the door opens and two people walk through the door. And we thought, ah, oh, that's interesting. That could cause a problem. And again, so we asked the NSA, you know, is this real? And the NSA immediately came back and said, oh, no, no, it's not a door. It's a turnstile. And a turnstile is different from a door because it only allows one person through per token. And if you've ever been to a really secure establishment, certain ones you could think of, you'll find they have turnstiles. And not little things like at the sports stadium where you go to see football, big turnstiles which run from the ceiling to the floor with glass screens and you stand inside it and it goes click and allows one person to shuffle through. Um, these things are there for a good reason and it's to prevent the shoulder surfing attack of people nipping through when the doors open. So that was an interesting little observation. Uh, John Knight at Virginia has been re-verifying it using refinement from Z to Spark, using his verification approach called ECHO. I refer you to John to find out more about that. Uh, Paul Jackson at Edinburgh has been improving the automation of the code proofs by translating our verification conditions out to SMTLib format and then competing Z3 and Yikes and CVC3 and Altergo, all these different theorem provers, to see who wins or see which one can um, discharge the most verification conditions automatically. So that's leading into some, I to in to some insight into how we need to improve the verification tools. Some other things that could be done that nobody's picked up yet, um, and if you feel inspired, we would love anybody to try some of these challenges. Better yet, get your students to try these challenges. If you have students looking for something to do, needing a project, please try, and we would love to support these. Um, first up, let's build some hardware. So we've done this software simulation of the, the, the operational environment. Why don't we build some hardware? A little door, fingerprint reader, smart card reader. Build a hardware rig that we could put in a lab for students to use as, a, as, a, as an exercise in secure software engineering or real-time embedded engineering. Um, and you could throw away all the support software and recode all the device, actually build real device drivers for the hardware, all in Spark. And then you'd have a complete solution and prove the whole thing. Um, I was very pleased that Microsoft have already done this for us and produced the Gadgeteer system because um, what we need is a little modular platform for building little bits of hardware. And I was very pleased to see yesterday the Gadgeteer presentation. I thought, great, we could use that to build a little tokenier model. Um, we could even do a bare board implementation. We'd get rid of the, the .NET CLR runtime and go straight down to the bare board ARM processor and run it on there. Um, so if anyone fancies picking that up, that would be a fantastic little project to build. Um, and it even rhymes. I don't know how we manage that. But... Uh, some other possible challenges. Um, prove the remaining security properties. As I said, we, we basically ran out of money, thanks, um, for proving the security properties in the Z and the code. So let's try the remaining proofs of the outstanding security properties. Um, you never know. You might find they're not true, um, and you can, you can win a prize or something. Um, I'll buy you a pint or something if you can find a bug in those things. Don't quote me on that. Um, you could start with our specification and just re-implement the whole thing in your chosen programming language and verification combination of choice. So VCC, maybe, or uh, one of the other languages that we've seen this week. Why not re-implement the whole thing and show us how well you can do? Um, we'd really like to attack the automation issue. Um, with the addition of the Spark tools that were in use when we released the system, um, we got about 95% of the VCs automatically proven we pushed that to about 99% by pushing in some lemmas to, to help the theorem prover. What I'd really like is to get that to 100. Um, which theorem prover will be the first um, to produce a 100% automated proof of this system? That would be a nice little milestone. Um, I would like, to, before I finish, to thank a few people, um, particularly the remarkable team that did this work in the first place. Um, 
The actual team that did the engineering was led by my colleague Janet Barnes, um, who's still with Praxis. David Cooper, um, who was very well known in this world a few years ago, um, unfortunately, well, lost for computer science. David left computer science a few years ago and became a physiotherapist. I don't know why. Uh, but he does come back and teach Z now and again for us. So he's the only physiotherapist in the world that teaches Z. <laughs> um, and a chap called David Painter, who left Praxis a few years ago and we've lost track of. But they were the original team. I would like to give a particular nod to our sponsor and our customers at the NSA, who played the role of customer, if you like. Um, it was a really remarkable piece of work for them, firstly to give, to give us the job in the first place, to give, for, to, to give the work to a British company was very unusual, and then to follow through with the open source release six years later took some real determination on the part of NSA. Um, these people know who they are, I, I will refrain from naming them. Um, SPRE, a chap called Bill, um, who did the testing work, did a really great job. Um, and thanks to people who've inv been involved with the VSR, Tony, Jim, um, Jay, everyone else, for encouraging us to kind of stick at it and get this material out there for you. It would have been easy to give up, um, and I'm glad we didn't. So, pleased about that. Um, what I would like you to do next, um, go grab it. Just Google for the word tokenir, you will find the download material. <coughs> Take a look at it, see what you think. If you find it's useful, great. I would love people to do some science um, or some experiments with this material. Um, and please tell us what you're up to. We, we want to get a community going around this work, like the free Artos work as well. And that's fantastic. Um, and tell us how you get on. So that's all I have for you. Thanks for your kind attention. Okay, so the question's about what does EAL5 plus mean? So um, the, the notation EAL5 plus just means the NSA said, well, aim at five, but do six or seven if you can in some areas. We, we tried to go beyond five as far as possible. The details of the sort of compliance with EAL5, six, and seven is in the project summary report, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. So here's motivation for you to go and download it. There is an analysis somewhere of the various common criteria if, um, objectives at each level and showing which ones we think we hit and which ones we missed. So it, the data is there. Um, the second question, uh, the security property, I think the main one we proved, there's a security property that relates the presence of the guard with the state of the door and the state of the alarm. It's something like if the guard is present and the, gu if the, guard is present and the door is open, then the alarm might not be ringing, I think is what it is. Something like that, there's an invariant that relates the presence of a guard to the state of the door and the state of the alarm system. It was that one we attacked. Was the guard present or the alarm system? Both. Yeah, both. Okay. Modulo, there's an abstraction. At, at some point, there's an abstraction that says we believe the I.O. devices actually affect the outside world and stuff like that. Yeah, sure. That was the one we did. There are about five others which remain as challenges to prove. Thanks. Okay, we can move on. Yes. Thank you, Tony. Um, so, um, I'll let me start by telling you the story about how this project started. Uh, but before I do that, I want to um, acknowledge the, my collaborators who are listed on the left, Gerard Holzman and Alex Gross, who are um, my uh, colleagues. Um, Alex is now at the Oregon State University. And then summer interns, Cheng Hu, John Erickson, and Rugang Zhu. And this work was uh, done by our group, the Lab for Reliable Software, which is at uh, the uh, NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, 
In case you're not familiar with uh, Jet Propulsion Repository or JPL, it's the uh, branch of NASA that's that does most of the um, unmanned robotic missions. So um, you've probably heard of um, a lot of the stuff that JPL has done, the two voyagers which are at the edge of the solar system now, Cassini which is orbiting Saturn, Galileo which went to Jupiter, Mariners, uh, the Mars rovers. And there's a lot of excitement at JPL right now because we're gearing up for our next big mission which is the Mars uh, Science Laboratory which is the next rover that's going to uh, launch to f uh, for Mars um, sometime in November this year. Um, and as, uh, you know, as uh, missions are um, getting uh, more complex, uh, scientists are getting more ambitious with what they want to achieve with these missions. So for instance, the Mars Science Laboratory is aptly named. It's a roving laboratory. It has all these instruments, arms, drills, can collect samples. It can do 720p HD video, uh, stereo video. Um, so, so what's happening is that um, these uh, spacecraft are gathering lots of data and um, the, 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 gr the growing need for data um, is driving um, the, the problem of how do we actually manage all this data and how do we, d uh, how do we on as engineers building the spacecraft, design the spacecraft uh, to deal with that. And one of the things that this has led to is um, an uh, interest in the use of flash memory. So the, um, old, uh, in the old days, spacecraft used to use um, Record tape recorders and 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 uh, other media which were um, which had some failure modes and but more problematically, they were big, bulky, expensive, had moving parts which could fail. Flash memory is very attractive. Um, it has it's cheap. It's uh, low. Um, it's had high density, no moving parts, which is one of the big attractions for spacecraft design. And it's used in, in many different ways on the spacecraft. So it's used to store things that are sent up from the Earth. So things like configuration tables, um, command sequences, which tell the rover what to do uh, tomorrow. Um, and at the same time, the rover is collecting data. It's gathering um, engineering data, which records the health of the vehicle at any time. Um, you know, the temperature of certain sensors, the state of how much current is being drawn by the motors. It's also gathering all the science data, taking panoramas, stereo videos, and so on. So, um, so flash memory uh, is, is needed, uh, so we need um, to be able to manage all this data and, and we are going to use flash memory for it. So there's a need uh, for the uh, software that's running on the spacecraft to manage this and we, um, there's, uh, because there are so many different clients with, with different needs, uh, we want a nice abstraction layer and so the one that's very popular is um, a file system, it's a POSIX compliant file system, so similar to the file systems you have on your uh, on your desktops, um, and because it's uh, because file systems are flexible, they have, have you know fairly flexible naming schemes. They're well understood interfaces, and so they're easy to uh, to uh, for clients to to, uh, to use. Now um, the the what what uh, so this problem beca becomes interesting because there's uh, flash memory has certain characteristics that make it somewhat challenging uh, to use uh, and to to for to build reliable file systems, and I'll mention those in a minute. But um, our involvement began um, uh, when we first started our lab. There was a couple of missions that were using um, flash memory file systems, and they were um, using commercial products, and two different missions using two different commercial products had some issues with using their file systems. Um, and so we, uh, this project really started as, um, as a lunchtime conversation with my colleague Gerard Holzman and we, we, we had looked at some of these file systems and helped find some bugs and we were wondering why, um, why, it, why these are so complicated. The, the file systems are not very big, as you'll see they're about 7,000 lines of C. And um, so we, r we thought, well, it would be nice if we should, you know, we're, we're you know, people who promote formal methods, so we should really try to use formal methods to build a, a, a good reliable file system um, and see, you know, why is it difficult. And so we started off as a pilot project um, to study how to apply formal methods uh, in the context of spacecraft software development. And um, well, fortunately, unfortunately, it um, uh, word got around a little bit at JPL and we got approached by a, uh, by a team that was building something called the multi-mission architecture platform, which was supposed to be this reusable software platform for use uh, that JPL missions were going to use. Um, and, they and they basically suggested to us um, well, if you're willing to um, implement this file system according to our needs, we'll include it in our platform. 
And of course, that was uh, too good an opportunity for us to pass up. But that offer came with some strings attached, and the strings were, it has to be implemented at C, it has to integrate as part of a much larger uh, uh, platform they were building. It had to obey their flight coding guidelines, which meant they have uh, certain rules on flights. Uh, when you build uh, spacecraft software, uh, flight software, you have to follow certain rules, like no dynamic memory allocation, no recursion, uh, which you can imagine in a file system makes it um, a little bit more challenging. Um, and also, and the big kicker for us was um, they, we had to, because now we are part of a, uh, uh, of, a, of a project that has to deliver certain capabilities at certain schedule, um, we had to deliver functionality at certain, uh, at a, uh, you know, certain functionality at certain uh, well-defined time points. And then the next thing that happened was um, the Mars Science Laboratory mission was, uh, was ramping up and, and getting ready to build their software, and then they asked um, if they were interested, and they offered um, uh, that they would use our file system, and then it became uh, much more, um, uh, uh, it became more real, I guess. Um, and so what started off essentially as, um, you know, um, a, a nice pilot project hit the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the wall of reality. And, and you will see how we have tried to deal with that while still trying to, you know, achieve some level of reliability. Now there's, um, our, the, our, our hope was to build uh, a flash <laughs> file system that would be used um, by, by JPL, it would be a capability that JPL would have. So. Um, so we are now in discussions with, uh, with a future mission, which is going to launch in 2014, and they're probably going to use uh, a, a version of this. So um, uh, before, I, before I go on to describing more details, let me say, as Tony mentioned, this, uh, uh, we, we, we described uh, this. Uh, well, once we realized this was an interesting problem, we, we you know, proposed it. Um, and and uh, there's been, uh, there was previous work on this w all the way back to the late 1980s when Carol Morgan and Bernard Sufren had written um, a specification of the Unix file system in Z. Um, and then after that, there's been a lot of work, um, and I'm not going to go through the list. I've listed here a bunch of uh, names in orange which um, have uh, been <coughs> related to the Verified Software Initiative. Um, and who pe these are a lot of people. I'm <coughs> there may be some more work. This is, I think, a list as of um, a year and a half ago. Um, um, so, so a lot of interesting work, and in many cases, uh, some of these people have been much more ambitious than us. Um, and as I said, um, for us, some of our, um, our um, ambitions have been constrained by the, the need to meet project deadlines and to produce something um, on, on schedule and with changing requirements. So um, let me say a little bit more uh, about why a flash file system is interesting. And to do that, uh, let me first describe uh, flash some characteristics of flash memory that make, that make it an interesting and challenging problem. So here they are. So you can think of a flash device as being um, a, essentially a, a, an array of blocks, and each block is an array of pages. So think of it as a two-dimensional array of pages. And, and really, there are three interesting operations. There's an operation called read page, where you can read a single page. Um, you can write a page, um, and now there's a constraint here. You can only write to a page that has been erased. Um, and how do you erase a page? You have to use an operation called erase, but unfortunately, an erase operation doesn't erase a single page, it erases an entire block. Um, and if you try to write, overwrite a page that has already been written, you get corruption. So, and essentially, you can imagine that that causes havoc. So, um, now, if you, if you go and think about this a little bit, um, you'll see, um, and, I'll, and I'll mention in a, in a minute, um, how this influences the, the design of the file system. Um, now, if that weren't bad enough, there's, um, there are some additional constraints. It turns out that blocks have limited lifetime, so you can only erase a block so many times before it starts to degrade. Um, and typically, this for dev modern devices, uh, the lifetimes are of the order of 100,000 or a million erase cycles, after which the blocks start becoming very unreliable. So what you really want to avoid is um, erasing one particular block many, many times. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, increase the lifetime of the device uh, overall, uh, and maintain its capacity, then you really want to spread the writes around as much as possible, uh, the erase cycles around as much as possible. And, and that's a procedure called wear leveling. Um, and that's um, one of the things that you have to do uh, with flash file systems. So, um, so why are flash file systems so hard? So um, 
the, the, if you think back to what traditional file systems do, traditional file systems store file system metadata. So when you boot up a computer, it looks to the media to, f to reconstruct what the file system structure is. And um, typically, uh, traditional file systems use these things called super blocks, which are stored at fixed locations. And, and they usually store multiple super blocks in case you get some media failure. But th because they're at fixed locations, when you boot up, you know exactly where to look. The problem is, in Flash, you can't, do, you can't do that. You can't store data in fixed locations. Um, and the reason is really, um, if you think about um, the, the constraints I said before, um, I, I won't go into too much detail because of lack of time, but um, essentially the, the, the fact that you can't overwrite something in place means you have to, you have to write it somewhere else. And, and the need for where leveling, which is to distribute the erase cycles around, requires that you have to move data around, even data that's never changing has to eventually be moved around just to uh, keep the erase cycles even. And, um, and then in, in on top of that, um, Flash, because you can occasionally get, because, it, because blocks degrade over time, um, you can occasionally get failures. And so you have to, if you're doing a write, you might encounter a failure on a block. And what you typically want to do is make that failure transparent to the client. And so you need to do automatic retry, and so a certain amount of bounded automatic retry. Okay, so. This, um, this, if you take these constraints together and start writing, trying to design a file system, you, you, it, it turns out to be an interesting non-trivial problem, um, which is one of the reasons we, we proposed it. So if you look at what the specification looks like, informally, you, you, I think you're all familiar with what a POSIX specification looks like. There are operations for creating files and directories, writing files, and so on. Our, our file system has some additional operations. Um, um, an interesting one is something called create recursive, which creates an entire um, a chain of uh, a, a, a subdirectory tree and, and uh, as a single operation, and room tree, which removes an entire subdirectory tree in a single operation. Um, we, we make some simplifications because we are uh, working on a single spacecraft, which uh, so we are allowed to have uh, to uh, we, we know the kinds of um, uh, use uh, use uh, patterns we have, so we don't have to deal with things like file permissions, links, concurrency, and so on. Um, the one thing that we do have to do is have what's called reset reliability, which is that at any time you might lose power, and so the file system may be in the middle of an operation. And so you have to guarantee that when you reboot, because we are talking about an autonomous vehicle, yeah, we have to preserve its health. And so we have to guarantee that the file system will survive unexpected reboot without getting corrupted. And, and then we also have to deal with, with media failures, so you can get um, failures uh, while you're writing to a blog page or erasing a blog. And in our case, there's, a, there's an additional feature. So most flash file systems have to deal with these. Uh, our case, there's an additional feature because once we launch, we are, that's, uh, you know, we, that's it. From then on, the clock starts ticking on the flash memory. So uh, we also want to try to minimize the number of writes. And, and our file system tries to minimize uh, how many writes it does for any particular operation. Now, um, going, going now to taking a formal view of this, um, the formalization of the POSIX part of the spec is fairly straightforward. Uh, Carol Morgan and Bernard Sufren, as I mentioned, did it many years ago. Uh, essentially, you can think of writing pre and post conditions over the, for each POSIX operation. Uh, you think of defining an abstract tree data structure. That's what a file system is. Uh, and then you, for, for given that tree data structure, you define every POSIX operation by its pre and post state. Remember, I said we, we, we're going to ignore concurrency. Um, now, one thing that you don't, that there are, there are some caveats to POSIX. Uh, the, the operation can return no space, and modeling that is, is kind of complicated. So I want, but, and we do something else with that. Um, POSIX doesn't talk about things like reset reliability, but we have to extend the spec to do that. So, um, so we have to define a notion of what it means for a reset, um, what it means for the file system to be reset reliable. And what we did was, um, now here's, one of the first design choices you have to make. How, what, what, what guarantee do you want to make? And the answer is that what we have learned is to make this as strong as possible. The stronger you make the spec, the easier it becomes to write, to do the verification. And, and I'll, mention, I'll, I'll describe that in a moment. So uh, in our case, um, the, the requirement that we added was any file system operation, if there's a reset in the middle of that operation, it'll behave as if, as if either it never happened at all or as if the operation completely fully successful. And there's an exception if you're doing a large write. Uh, if you're writing 100 megabytes, then you don't want to provide that guarantee for performance reasons. Um, but I won't go into that. And then 
for, for block failures, the guarantee is, again, the, the block failure will be completely transparent, again, assuming um, certain bounded, bound on the number of failures you can get consecutively. Um, so um, our experience. So first, we started thinking of writing the file system um, using you know, a formal um, uh, specification language. Um, and if you, if you, you, you can see that, a f you know, as, as I mentioned, the file system defines a recursive data type, which is a tree. Um, and the key properties that describe the file system, uh, if you think about the pre and post conditions, they all talk about reachability. And it turns out that reachability is traditionally hard. We, we, most of our verification is based on first order logic, and reachability can't be expressed directly. So you have to work around this, and that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's an interesting challenge. So we started off by first thinking, well, let's do the top level design. So we started writing some specs, and w uh, my summer intern and I sort of had this little, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, challenge going on, and I wrote a spec using Leslie Lambert's TLA+. Plus. He wrote a spec uh, uh, in something uh, that, um, in, a, in a, some uh, flavor of VDM. Um, and then one of the things we, we ran into quickly was, um, while these specs were useful for studying the design decomposition and, and you know, clearing the design in our heads, um, eventually we had to produce C code. And there was too large a semantic gap between these specifications and the actual C code that we had to write and test. Um, and given the constraints on, on schedule, mostly on schedule and also on manpower, um, we, we didn't feel we could really bridge that gap very successfully. So what we did instead was, um, after going through this iteration, we decided to build a reference implementation. And so the reference was written by my colleague Gerard Holzman. Um, it's about 1,300 lines of C. Um, one of the nice features of the reference is that it's executable because it's a C um, implementation. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, you, can, you can just run it, uh, which, which uh, as, uh, as you'll see, is, is very useful um, for testing. And the other thing that's nice about it is, uh, and I'll mention this too, is that it facilitates model checking, with the sp in spe uh, especially with the spin model checker. Now, why is a reference simpler? Um, why did we choose to write a reference in C? Uh, well, it turns out that we can make the reference simpler. Um, one of the things we can do is that the reference doesn't have to deal with flash hardware. It, it deals with perfect hardware that you, it's essentially an array, you think of uh, this being an array of pages that can be overwritten in place, just like memory. Um, you don't have to worry about the reference being fault tolerant because the actual system provides the atomicity illusion. The real system, you, if, if an operation, if you get a reset, the, the reference only has to match the pre or the post state. So um, you don't have to worry about any inter intermediate states. So the reference can be very, that simplifies the reference. And, and then you can also simplify the design of the reference because you can use recursion, for instance, which simplifies the, uh, the code. Um, so the correctness obligation is, is exactly what you would expect if you're familiar with these kinds of proof. You define an abstract file system state, which is a finite tree with labeled nodes. You define a mapping. And then you define a state, uh, um, this, these state functions on, on the reference and the actual target fun uh, state, uh, the target implementation. Um, and they, so for any state of either of those implementation, you define a mapping to this, um, to this abstract file system state, and then you essentially show the normal commutative diagram for any state of the reference. If you apply an operation with certain arguments and you apply it to the target, um, then the states match. And there's a case where you get a reset, then the post state must match either the pre or the po uh, post state. So, th so this is all fairly um, straightforward, um, the you know, standard correctness proof. So um, once we've identified uh, this and we built the reference, so now the question is how do we do the verification and what technologies can we use? And so here's where we now have to live with the realities of, of cost and, and, and schedule. So the, what we did was um, we essentially think of, uh, you take an abstract program like this, which basically says pick an ar arbitrary operation with some arbitrary arguments and optionally inject a fault, which could be a reset or a bad block failure. Perform the operation on the real file system, perform the same operation with the same arguments on the reference, compare the results of the operation, compare the, um, the abstract states, and then check some invariance on the real file system. And then keep doing this. Um, so essentially, see if you can get a failure for, for starting in any particular, in any arbitrary state where the two file systems are equivalent, see if any iteration of this can produce a failure. So that's the, that's the check that we want to do. Um, and um, one of the things I'll mention is that, um, so 
So now what's nice about this is that you can use this for testing. So you can imagine having a randomized tester that's doing this choosing randomly. So you can essentially iterate this millions of times um, and then see if you can find a bug that way. You can use it for model checking. And then of course you can also try to use this as essentially the, the body of a proof. What we found was um, one of the things that we, we, we learned early on was that if you look at the order of the assertions, if either of the assertions that, can, that show whether the file systems agree, if they fail, um, then the, the, uh, one of the invariants of the file system should also fail. And if, if, if that's not the case, then the file system invariants are not strong enough. And I won't say much more about that, but if you want, uh, that turned out to be actually a very nice way to strengthen invariants. So if you ever get that failure of A or B, uh, you should make sure that C is also failing. So, um, so, after, so we originally built a random tester, but then we also um, applied model checking to it. And um, so we, uh, to use model checking, we used naturally the spin model checker, which is built uh, by Gerard Holzman, uh, who's in the office next to me. Uh, it's an explicit state model checker for checking properties um, in linear temporal logic. Spin is actually an interesting, uh, has an interesting design which, which makes it convenient for us. It takes a promela, unlike normal model checkers, a spin takes a model and a property and compiles it into a C file, which you can then compile with GCC to produce an object file. And when you run this object file, this running this will check whether M satisfies Q. Um, what's nice about this is that even though this input language to spin is promela, because you're eventually producing a C program, it's very easy to modify spin to accept a promela model with embedded C code with fragments of embedded C code which call, make calls to the file system. And, and if you then link the files, the real file system and the target and the, the reference file systems to this C file, you are now executing actual, in the, in the Promela, in the, in the spin exploration of, of your model, you're executing the real file system code, which is really convenient because then you are, um, you're, you're, not, you're not just relying on, a, on an abstraction on, an, on a model but you're, um, you're able to verify the real code. Five minutes? Okay, so um, now if, if you're familiar with model checking, you know that you have to deal with the state space explosion problem. And there are no really nice solutions to the state space explosion problem. There are just some engineering um, heuristics that you can use, and, and we've applied a few of them. So one of them is to uh, test with very small finite models um, to, to reduce the state space. And one of this, uh, one of the, uh, what this required us to do was to make sure that our file system was capable of, uh, to be used with, uh, with small flash configurations. It, it's surprising when, when we've looked at other file systems, uh, many of them require a certain pretty large minimum flash size because they were, nobody ever uses, you know, a flash with four pages and four, uh, four blocks and four pages per block. But if you want to really do model checking, you can get interesting, con interesting enough configurations that you should allow your file system not to have any dependencies that, that, that don't let it be used in, in a small configuration. So, so that's one of the things we built in from the beginning. Um, we've defined abstraction functions. Ideally, in model checking, you want to define sound abstraction functions so that if you uh, exhaustively ver do a verification, you can then uh, conclude that the original system is sound. Unfortunately, in practice, once your system is interesting enough, uh, coming up with sound abstraction functions is too difficult. And then we've used ideas from uh, context-bounded model checking, which is we um, bound the number of faults that can happen, which is essentially like the idea from uh, I that people have been using at Microsoft for uh, uh, context-bounded model checking. Um, the other thing that we can do is now, if because uh, after uh, very quickly model checking runs out of steam and you can't uh, uh, finish the state space, uh, checking the state space exhaustively, um, we can still do randomization. So if you make the model checker random, if you uh, make its choices of transitions random, um, you can es effectively you can use it as a randomized search engine. Um, and one of the things we found is that if you use unsound abstractions, so essentially you, you write an abstraction and you're, not, you're sure it's not sound, um, what happens is that the abstraction forces the model checker to stop exploring a certain state part of the state space and backtrack and go search another part of the state space. And in our early uh, efforts, we had written a separate randomized tester. Um, 
And, and what we found was that if we start using unsound abstractions and, and using model checking, we would get at least as good coverage um, as using the, the original random framework. And so essentially, we've stopped building random test frameworks. We just use the model checker with, with these unsound abstractions. And that's been kind of an interesting uh, experience we, we, that we haven't um, thought of. So um, of course, model checking again and random testing only gets you so far. Um, there are certain classes of properties that are very, very difficult um, to get to verify in these ways. Um, one of them is um, uh, uh, resource uh, leaks. Uh, resource leaks are actually pretty hard to, to, ch to check. Um, uh, or to, they're very hard to find with, 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 the exi with things like model checking and random testing. And really for that, you need more heavyweight um, verification engines. Um, so um, uh, we had done some, I had a summer intern, John Erickson, uh, who worked with Jay Moore, uh, visit um, to do an initial proof of ACL2. And it turned out to be surprisingly difficult. We were looking at a very small piece of the code, and he spent three months and had a hard time doing the verification. And what we'd learned from that experience was that the code was just too complicated um, for him to verify. And that essentially led to a refactoring of the entire code, and, and, um, and we, we had to break it up so uh, with an eye to make the, make the invariance simpler. Um, we have not uh, re-attempted that proof, but I think hopefully we'll, make more uh, we'll have better success. So what I'd really like to do next is to use the Microsoft C verifier, which um, Stefan has been demoing in the lobby. Um, one of the, uh, because we have started by using a reference that's already written in C, this sort of makes it very nice, uh, very well suited, I think, for VCC, because VCC, essentially, the way you do proofs with VCC is you write a ghost implementation or a ghost reference in C. Um, and so, um, so that's what we'd like to do. Um, the, the, the sort of the stumbling block is that using a theorem prover like VCC requires significant expertise. And so to get making that initial transition it is takes a fair amount of effort. And, and I will stop there since I'm running a bit over. I don't know if there's oh, thank you very much. Uh, do we have time for some questions? Yes? Um, that's, the, that's the inner loop of the spin. So th think of this as a spin non-deterministic choice, uh, which, is, which you can use randomization for. So, so we do is exactly these steps. So these are both written in C, so they're just calls to C, to C libraries. Okay, one, is a reference. one is a reference, one is a real file system. And then you call them, and then you check that the return values of the, so POSIX functions return a value, uh, you know, an, an error code. So you check the error codes, which is the first assertion. The second assertion, you build the abstract states. So you see some arbitrary evaluation of these states. That's right. And in, in the logic, you're doing the first phase for all the arguments. That's right, with, with all possible arguments, which is why the state space calls. It. And this is where you start up to play games with okay. abstractions. Okay. And then you also we also check invariance. So I, I, can, I can go offline why this is actually. There are certain properties that can't be checked because the, ab the abstraction doesn't model them. 